We talk music and the mind. Musician, composer, and psychologist, Dr. Michael DeMaria on this edition of Conversations. Most people are fortunate if they find success with one career, much less two. But Dr. Michael Brandt DeMaria has done just that. For more than two decades, he's had a successful psychology practice, while at the same time building a secondary career as a composer and musician. His music has put three consecutive albums at number one on the New Age charts. You can add to that four Grammy nominations and the fact that he was a contributor on a Grammy-winning children's album. And you see, his music resume is quite impressive. What's even more unique is how Dr. Di Maria has married psychology and music to form a holistic approach to enhancing one's life, a message he communicates through his speaking and writing. He's also the author of three books, including a book of poetry. We welcome Dr. Michael DeMaria to Conversations. You're a busy guy. <laughs> yes, Jeff. I, I stay pretty busy. And, and thanks so much for having me. It's great it, to it's, be here. It's absolutely my pleasure. First of all, congratulations. Another Grammy nomination. And also, you were a contributor to an album, a children's album, which actually won a Grammy. Yes, Jeff. Just, just this last week. Yep. Congratulations. Yes. Tell me so about much. the children's album. Well, the children's album, Jeff, is named All About Bullies, Big and Small, and it's, it's a really wonderful project. I actually met the producers at last year's Grammys, and they were kind enough to, when they found out I was a psychologist and, and also a poet, as well as a musician, they said, we would love to have you contribute to this album. And, and I had shared with them that I actually was a child protection team psychologist here in Escambia and Santa Rosa County for many years, too. So number one, I'm, I'm an advocate of children. Right, uh, right. Number two, I was a victim of bullying myself growing up at different times. So I really jumped at the chance to be part of this right. you know, process and program. And I actually wrote a series of poems about bullying with a real positive message. And what was really cool was they actually had children read my poetry over a track of my original music. Okay. And so uh, the response has been great. And to actually be there at the Grammys this last week and see it actually win a Grammy was a highlight for me. If you were going to describe your music to someone who had never heard it, how would you describe it? That's a great question, Jeff. A phrase that often comes to my mind is sonic journeys for the soul. Okay. And, you know, my music has always been about healing. And, and I, I like to share the story often when I try to describe my music that it goes back to the time when I was six, seven years old, recuperating from some surgery as a child. And my parents had a big piano in the living room. And I'd just go to the piano and just like close my eyes and hit one note at a time. And I remember really loving to hear that one note just kind of arise and then slowly dissipate off into silence. And ever since then, uh, I realized that music you know, looking back on it as a psychologist was a form of self-soothing for me. Mm -hmm. And I was almost in some way putting myself in a, in a trance. Uh -huh. um, my children, my, my parents just thought I was autistic. <laughs> but I really, really um, found that using music in almost a meditative way. So a lot of my music is um, about healing, uh -huh. really trying to create a sense of relaxation for the listener. You know, my main goal is to try to quiet the mind and open the heart. Why, why does music evoke so many emotions in us? That's a great question, a perennial question, and something I, I think about a lot and have researched cross-culturally. Um, I'm kind of an amateur ethnomusicologist, <laughs> okay. and you know, I have these instruments from all over the world, and a lot of my music is about this world fusion. Because we find throughout the world that um, many indigenous people see music as the language of the soul. Mm -hmm. What I think they're trying to say in that is it crosses cultural barriers and cultural boundaries. And also, if you think about it, you can't hide from music. Right. You know, if there's a, there's a painting, you can choose not to look at it. But when there's music playing, it's coming into your ears, coming into your body, coming into your heart, and it, it kind of penetrates through a lot of our logical, rational, ego defenses. Right. You know, when someone's talking to us, we can kind of filter out what they're saying or categorize it. Mm -hmm. But music has a way of just acting right on our heart at a very intimate, deep level. 
There's also indigenous people who believe that music is the doorway between the worlds, that it's, it's a way in which we touch those deeper spiritual truths. And um, I, I actually have, uh, you know, a, a little story about that. I've played my flutes at times for hospice patients. Right. And I played it one time for a woman who, late 30s, very tragically, who was dying of cancer. Mm. Um, she was also a surfer. Wow. She loved to surf, and it was, uh, it was tragic seeing her go through this. And the first time I came to play for her, she was in a coma. And so the nurses said, go ahead and play. You know, we don't know if she's going to come out or not. So I played, and when she came out, she said, I had a dream that there was a Native American person coming and playing the flute for me. And they said, that wasn't a dream. The person was actually here. So they uh, asked me to come back. She said, can he come back? So I did. So when I was playing, when I came back, um, I was playing a song. I always improvise when I play mm -hmm. in this way. And she said, after I played, she said, what song is that? I said, I don't know. It must be your song because I've never played it before. And she said, it's the strangest thing because it gives me such comfort and makes me think about the wave I rode in on. And it gives me courage to ride the wave back out. Wow. And from that moment on, I, I really realized that some of my indigenous teachers who talked about music being a gateway between um, this world and the other world, maybe they were, maybe they were right. They were on to something. Yeah. yeah. How long have you been playing flute? About 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago, I was going through a very difficult time. I, I was working with the child protection team and had been involved with a very severe, difficult place uh, in, in, in case where um, a child actually was, was murdered. And as part of my own healing, I found myself on a Native American reservation up in Canada. And it was the first time I heard the Native American flute. And it, and it literally just brought tears to my eyes. And uh, when I when I got back, I said, I need to find a flute because that, that sound is something I need to be able to express the feelings I have inside. Um, so I've been playing ever since. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. What else do you play? Well, I grew up playing piano and percussion. Okay. Um, my, I first saw my first live jazz performance. I was about nine years old, and we were at the um, high school in Connecticut where um, I grew up initially. And I saw this jazz drummer on stage, and he was just like his, you know, hands were going every which way. And uh, I, I told my parents when I got back, I said, I, I know what I want to do with my life. I want to be a drummer. <laughs> they, were, they were horrified. We were a quiet <laughs> Catholic family. But I, they, they said, well, if you keep practicing on your practice pad, you know, a little piece of wood with some plastic on it, <laughs> um, we get you a real set of drums. So I played drums growing up. I played piano. Um, I got my first Moog synthesizer when I was 18. I loved synthesizers and okay. keyboards. Um, and I used to create a lot of relaxation tapes for clients early on in my practice. It was really a justification for me buying a bunch of instruments and justifying <laughs> it to my wife. Um, but then I really got into the flute about 20 years ago and what often is called indigenous aerophones, which are instruments where you make music with your breath. Mm -hmm. So I've studied the Australian didgeridoo. I play Australian didgeridoo. I play shakuhachi, Japanese indigenous flute, a little bansori from India, which is another kind of flute. So I really am a multi-instrumentalist, and anything I can get my hands on, I usually try to play. I see. But the flute's the passion. That's the passion. You know. That's how I've yeah. kind of gotten known, and yeah. nothing gives me more joy. It's as if when I'm playing a flute and making music with the breath, I close my eyes, and it's it's the closest thing to flying, Jeff, yeah. I've experienced in this lifetime. Yeah, interesting. How did you get into psychology? If you, you had the, as a young person, you were into music, why psychology? Well, it's it's a little bit of a funny story, and I hope my, my dad, if he's listening, doesn't, uh, he, when he ever hears this. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to be a music major. I actually wanted to study ethnomusicology and music, and so I told my father, who was born in Italy, moved here when he was 21 after the war. And I said, you know, Dad, I want to be a, I want to be a musician. And he goes, you know, uh, you know, what are you talking about? You know, you get a, you're a first generation son of an immigrant. You need to be a doctor, a lawyer. Your kids <laughs> be artists and musicians. He was a hardcore uh, PhD chemical engineer. And um, so 
I was a dutiful son, son who, uh, who believed him. Um, and so I, I started thinking, well, what kind of, what kind of doctor can I be and still play music <laughs> and paint and do art and uh, theater and things like that? And I came across um, the whole area of music therapy, art therapy, play therapy. And I said, wow, here I could be a doctor, but I could also, you know, be creative and explore music and, and these other areas. So I, I started taking psychology classes and really fell in love with it. And I've always been fascinated with uh, human emotions, yeah. uh, dreams, the human mind. Yeah. And so I really, I, I've loved my work in psychology and it really has worked out well. And I'd say, you know, the other thing that's interesting about it is to compose music and play music, you really have to listen always listening and that's what you're doing in psychology too as a therapist I spend most of my time listening yeah. which is somehow connected to me to music yeah. so I often like to say I'm actually with the client listening to the music of their soul you know just in terms of what they express and share so I still love what I do although I'm down to a much smaller practice now than than ever before because I'm spending so much time with the composing and writing you said something that I want to ask you about as a psychologist, listening. Do we as a society listen enough? No, not even close. Not even close. Why? We're distracted. We, we are distracted by all of the uh, sensationalism. And, and I think in a, there are advantages to capitalist culture, consumer culture, but one of the downsides is everybody's trying to sell you something. And a lot of, um, I think the other thing I like to say is that um, through nobody's fault, I think it's just the way it's evolved, that we live in a very extroverted, um, egocentric culture, which means that there's so much noise mm -hmm. out in the world that people don't spend enough time listening. I would say one of my missions on the planet is to help people listen more, uh, listen to each other more, and perhaps most importantly, listen to ourselves more, to really listen to what I like to call the wisdom of the heart. Mm -hmm. So, I, and, and that's why my music is not about shouting or yelling or getting, it, it's very, you actually have to really listen and tune in. Hopefully it allows people to quiet their minds and listen more deeply. Would our personal relationships be better if we really focused on listening? Absolutely. Something we've talked about is communication. Mm -hmm. And I always like to say we have two ears and one mouth, and so we should be listening <laughs> twice as much as we're speaking. And relationships are built on, on this ability to really listen to each other. And most people also, I mean, one of the things that's powerful in psychology is very few people ever have the experience of somebody really listening to them, you know, focusing on them as if they're the only person in the world at that moment, which you actually do really well, by well, the way. Well, thank you, thank you. And I, I, I love how you do that on the show. And that's exactly what our world needs more of. And it develops into what we call presence. And presence is a result of deep listening. When we take a look, you mentioned egocentric. <clears throat> Our society has become so egocentric, and one of the things that we were talking about prior to going on air here was you just got back from the Grammys and the Whitney Houston tragedy. Mm. And I don't want to talk about this from a sensational standpoint because I don't, I don't think that's a, a good thing to focus on, but one would have to ask on the outside that she would seemingly have it all, why do you think she got into such a tragic scenario in her life? Oh, it's, it's a great question, Jeff, and it's a, a tragic, tragic situation and made this last Grammys um, out of the three I've been to by far the most moving. 